Okay, we can go ahead. I would like to welcome you all to today's event on AI and mass data sharing. Is it the future of legal ideas? And this event is part of a series called Law and Change, which is organized in cooperation between Bickel and Singapore Management University, and today also with the University of Lausanne. <laughs> Professor Mark Findley will moderate the session. He's also the co-convener of the series. And the event actually follows up on an earlier seminar that we did a couple of weeks ago entitled From Chat GPT to Law GPT. And we realized there are lots of uh, open questions that we would still like to discuss. And so we continue the discussion today with the same speakers. And the speakers are Michel Canassa. He is professor of private law and dean of the faculty of law at Université Catholique de Lyon. His research focuses a lot lately on the interaction between law and technology, contract and product liability. And he co-edited various Cambridge handbooks that you might have seen, the Cambridge Handbook of Artificial Intelligence, the Cambridge Handbook of Lawyering in the Digital Age, and on smart contracts, blockchain technology, and digital platforms. Then we have with us Julia Gentile. She is fellow in law at LSE Law School and teaches IT in the law and cyber law there. Her interests lie in EU constitutional law, law and technology, and the promotion of human rights in a digital environment. And she's one of the principal investigators of the EU-funded project Digi Public Values. It's a project that explores how to protect public values in the context of digitized public services. Our third speaker is Marion Audac. She's professor of private law at Artois University in France, and her current research focuses on the governance of AI in the EU, with a particular interest in standardization and consumer protection. She's a member of the French AI Standardization Committee and participates in working groups led by the European standardization organizations in the field of AI. Uh, then we have with us Gregory Levkovic. He is professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles and the director of the Smart Law Hub there. He is principal investigator at the AI Institute for the Common Good in Brussels and senior research fellow in business law and AI at the University of Nice. He teaches smart law indicators, algorithms, and big data at Sciences Po in Paris and is also a founding member of the International Platform of French-Speaking Experts in Law and AI. And we have with us as well Rebecca Williams. She's Professor of Public Law and Criminal Law at Oxford University, and her work focuses on the relationship of law and technology and the ways in which law needs to develop to keep pace with technology. She's a co-founder of the Oxford Law Tech Education Program, and her work examines optimum methods of decision making and has been cited by courts around the world. And finally, our moderator of today, Mark Findley, you know him already, I'm sure, from various events we've done together before. He is Professorial Research Fellow at Singapore Management University and the former director of the Center for AI and Data Governance and his research focuses on innovation technology and the law, AI and the law, and legal theory and ethics. So thanks to all of you for coming together again, despite the busy end of term time. And uh, with that, I give the floor to Mark and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eva. And I appreciate your capacity with foreign languages. I would have had a real difficulty introducing this fantastic panel. Um, let me just say that we are very lucky to have this group together and they agreed to, uh, to join a second session because I think they enjoyed the first session so much and there was also so much left unsaid. This session is designed to provoke and to stimulate and to challenge. So for those of you who are joining us, put your seat belts on and get ready for some really interesting discussion that will evolve over the next uh, hour or so. Can I also suggest to the audience that because this is designed as a conversation between the panelists and also a conversation with you, that should you want to uh, put a message in the chat or ask a question, uh, feel free to do that and we'll try and get to you as, as, as soon as we can. The, session is designed to look at not just those somewhat tired questions, I think, of the relationship between law and technology, 
which in many respects have been confined to discussions about the modernization of law and if you like the materialization of legal services in a technological age. I was at a conference last week on AI of governance and big data use and law wasn't mentioned once. And I think that says a lot. I think it says a lot because in many respects, lawyers have been slow to get into the game uh, beyond discussions about how do we make money through the use of technology or how do we save time? How do we get efficiencies? While at the same time, I think ignoring some very fundamental questions, the world of international commerce, for example, has been platformed and those platforms operate largely without legal regulation. Social media operates as a communication network, communication web, largely outside the control of law. And for those of you who are interested in the metaverse or interested in what we're allowed to call the metaverse now that uh, Facebook says it no longer exists, I would say that the virtual universe is not just a place for fast real estate. It is a place for freedom and opportunity or enclosure and just doing things in the same old way. And we're going to draw today on some quite interesting scholarship. It's not the first time that uh, academics have come together to talk about the possibilities for the relationship between law and technology and also digital transformation. How can law participate in social ordering the creation of safe digital spaces, how can law make a difference? But also I'd like to think about the way in which legal thinking, the foundations of law in fact, will be and are being changed through digital transformation and the way in which new technologies are in place. One final observation from me, and I will come back during sessions to add a few thoughts here and there, but one final observation is, as many of you may uh, know if you're old enough, this isn't the first time technology has challenged law. I was in legal practice when we had the introduction of word processing and the death of the secretarial pool. And at that time, my senior partner said to me, woe is me, the world is changing and I'm not ready for it. The difference now though, I think very simply, is we're dealing with massive data sharing and data transformation. And it's just the scope of that, um, if you like, that sea of information, uh, which is both a challenge to law and a challenge to law's role in governance. I'd like to start off with Gregory again, if we could today, um, and reflect a little through some of the work that he's been doing on the way in which uh, perhaps legal thinking as it has been is not well suited uh, for changes in the way in which information and knowledge is being processed. The idea, if you like, of the old causative legal frameworks, case by case reasoning, is that something which is just not suitable today? Or is it something in fact that we need to be developing more hybrid techniques to produce, uh, let's say, more modern uh, and more progressive ways of uh, using legal analysis. Gregory. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's a very complex question, of course, but um, let's uh, we'll try to, to say something about that. Um, it depends, I think it depends a little bit what we, what we, uh, what is the, 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 the importance that we want the legal I mean, let's say legal science, uh, also legal professionals to have uh, in in uh, in today and tomorrow world. In, I mean, what we can see, and you give already some, some kind of a very good example of uh, of that, is that um, <clears throat> we are uh, really entering in an advanced process of legal pluralism. I mean, in the sense that not only uh, uh, tech companies uh, are uh, developing everywhere, but also they are developing their own system to deal with dispute, for instance. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, 
we have even the regulators that ask, for instance, platforms to develop their system because uh, we cannot deal with the amount of cases that we may have to review. And that's where I think there is there is a there is a kind of uh, transformation in which the lawyers are not well equipped to address the kind of uh, issues that we need to deal with now. I, I mean, at least in the the, the, the digital ecosystem. Uh, in this perspective, I think that, for instance, the, the, the people working on rules as codes, the idea that we should develop uh, not only in a specific sector, not only rules written in natural language that we need them to interpret, uh, but also in uh, to at the same time to produce a kind of legal code so that we can directly implement, uh, companies can directly implement the code in their system I think this is something that, of course, looks a little bit uh, like sci-fi, but at the same time, I think it's an idea that will get, will get bigger and bigger. And there is one reason for that, is that uh, already today, we have something that uh, is a kind of translation gap uh, between the law or regulations that are uh, um, adopted by legislators or public authorities, and on the other hand, the IT system of companies. Today, the, the way we are working is that we have some kind of uh, regulations written in natural language. Then you have the in-house lawyers that have to uh, uh, study this regulation, understand what it means for a specific kind of company, then write a memo. This memo will be transferred to the IT system, to the IT people, then we'll have to see and discuss how they will implement that in the IT system because, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, company, a, a lot of requirements needs to be integrated in the IT system. And so this is the translation gap, and that's where uh, you 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 have. Uh, I mean, it would make sense, and it will make sense for legislators to say, okay, let's stop with uh, writing these uh, these rules or let's do something in addition to writing the rules, let's produce directly the code, and then we can ask companies to directly implement the code in their IT system. And that's where thinking as a lawyer uh, would change a little bit, because we are used to, to look at question on a case-by-case -case basis. And in this case, what you need to, to address is how, how do you transform the goal of a specific kind of regulation uh, how you or you or you will translate that into a, a code that you can apply systematically on a big amount of data, and I think this reflection of how how we switch from a perspective that focuses mainly on legal interpretation to a perspective in which we decide on uh, the best way to implement specific requirement in the system. Uh, uh, is is a is a is a is a challenge for 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 legal I mean, not only for legal professionals also for the academia, uh, and just to 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 finish with a, a last thing, of course when you do that, and that is something we can see already because for instance if you look at financial regulation or banking regulation, you can see that already they are written in a way that obviously. They were designed because, I mean, in a way that made it make it possible. It's possible to implement that in a system, and that we will have more and more. But then the question uh, is, what does that mean also for the autonomy of law of the law? Uh, and and I think that's that's important because uh, we are used to look at uh, at law as a kind of bespoke uh, activity. Uh, and also it's an activity that is really labor intensive. And that's why we have a very specific kind of industry working a certain way uh, and different kind of structures and in the academia and outside of the academia. But of course, as, as, as soon as you start to design rules uh, in a uh, uh, software system, uh, then the thing is that you will have some kind of phenomena that are more I mean, like 
uh, that we can see on other kind of markets, but that are quite different in the sense that we are transitioning from uh, labor intensive to a capital intensive law. And of course, that, that's, that's also a big challenge uh, for the autonomy of the different, uh, of the, the different states. And we have seen already in specific area like tax law or, or financial law, that sometimes it's easier and it costs less money to change the load and to change the technology. So we adapt the written rules so that we can use the system that were developed in the UK or developed in the US. Uh, and there, there is something to think about what does it mean to work in a world where we have some kind of capital intensive law. So that would be my, my, my kind of provocative idea to start the discussion. No. Okay, thank you very much for that, Gregory. And I can see the rest of the panel writing feverishly, which is always a good indication that you've thrown a few things out there for people to chew on. I was wondering, Michelle, do you um, not only have some thoughts that you might want to respond to coming to that, but I'm interested in your view about the way in which um, legal service delivery, the delivery of law itself is going to be essentially influenced and is being essentially influenced by the introduction of various technologies and particularly the way in which information and data are being managed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you again for the invitation. Uh, the, the, way I, the way I see it uh, uh, is that uh, AI and, uh, and the, um, the amount of data, of course, uh, um as an impact on the production of legal services as you as you know and the production of law generally speaking so um recently i, I don't know if you had the opportunity to see that there is a, a short uh, report and a list of recommendations by the european bar association and uh, and basically um one of the the main impacts is that these tools and these environments uh, allow to streamline uh, the, the legal service production of legal services so uh, there is a gain of productivity and so in theory you can produce more law and more le legal advice with the, the same amount of resources or probably uh, uh, e even less so um, th this can be viewed from uh, different angles. I, I think it's it's a positive thing if uh, um, it means that uh, uh, the access to legal ser service and legal advice is more democratic. So people who could not afford until now could afford a, a kind of legal advice uh, uh, thanks to uh, the gains of productivity. Uh, and uh, if you see it in a negative uh, perspective, uh, uh, it could mean that uh, you, you will need less lawyers to uh, to do uh, the same amount of, uh, of job, and and so it could disrupt the the, uh, the profession quite significantly. And uh, um, as I said la last uh, last time, I think that uh, there will be even more competition uh, among uh, among law firms. Uh, I've recently read an article on the Economist, uh, according to which these tools are, uh, in, especially ChatGPT, uh, is available for uh, a quite uh, low price to everyone, to any kind of law firm. So uh, maybe it could allow small law firms or individual lawyers to to do uh, uh, more or to do uh, to a certain extent the same things that big law firms can can do. But I'm quite skeptical. Uh, I think uh, I think that might lead to a, a, a bigger concentration of uh, of uh, within the world of law firms actually. Um, due to the gains of productivity. So uh, on the production side, I think that uh, um, we can decide that uh, it's a positive evolution in the sense that we, we make legal services more and more available to, uh, to, to, to citizens. Uh, and also we, we make it possible for legislators, as uh, Gregory said, to uh, you know, produce more effective uh, and more consistent uh, legal norms uh, thanks to 
the amount of data and uh, um, the, the, the po powerful tools to process this data. Um, but we, we have to decide so uh, because if we if we leave just the market uh, evolve, um, I don't think that we will reach uh, such a result. And then uh, the, the the other point is on the enforcement side, and uh, it uh, it's quite uh, connected to what Gregory just said. I think that automation, uh, which is made possible thanks to uh, the data sets and uh, and uh, and and softwares, uh, can uh, you know uh, improve. <laughs> Uh, one one of the issues with uh, with legal rules is uh, their enforcement, uh, and so if we decide so, uh, these uh, these uh, the, the technological environment could uh, could make enforcement of law more systematic, which uh, I guess would be uh, would be a, a good uh, a good thing. Um, um, Gregory mentioned as well the um, the trend uh, of uh, the private privatization of uh, of uh, the production of legal norms and uh, and uh, and the enforcement of uh, of legal rules, which according to me is not necessarily to be welcome, and uh, because in the end it's um, it's also a matter of sovereignty uh, for the states. Uh, or for you know uh, federations or confederation of states. So um, I still think that uh, the contribution of the legal community should be to continue to frame uh, what is going on to shape uh, also to a certain extent the technology in order to make sure that in the end, uh, uh, you know, citizens and states, but uh, even more citizens can decide uh, uh, the the real or the virtual world uh, in which they want to live. And for that, I think that uh, the production of norms and the enforcement of norms uh, of legal rules uh, uh, should still be uh, the monopoly or, or the 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 quasi monopoly of uh, of official uh, bodies that are. Uh, politically responsible in, in front of uh, in front of their uh, citizens. Uh, um, otherwise, you know, uh, companies do not have uh, this kind of political responsibility, and so people cannot express their approval or disapproval. Uh, um, so, again, I think it's like the concept of uh, uh, technological neutrality. I think that. Uh, um, if you, um, I think this data and uh, AI and other technologies are in principle quite neutral. Uh, um, so uh, it depends on which hands you, you put them. And I think that uh, they should still be in the hands of, uh, um, of uh, well, official <coughs> bodies uh, and including the states and this should still be in the hands of uh, lawyers because you know the uh, the the objective of uh, lawyers in the academia but also in the practice in courts and so on is to make sure that the society works uh, properly uh, according to choices you know we, we've made in terms of uh, um, protection of individuals uh, um, political responsibility um, and and so on. So, keeping the possibility to to make policy choices. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll throw two questions up in the air and not have them answered just yet. One is that your argument for the democratization of uh, lawmaking through the utility of technology is interesting because it does rely on the assumption that the machine itself is neutral. Uh, but as we've seen, the application, uh, and to some extent, I would say the dispossession of the state by becoming a partner in private sector information technology has meant that those uh, responsibilities, accountabilities that we've expected in public law governance just aren't there anymore. 
uh, and that might be a major question to, to consider. The other point I was going to raise too was just, and, and just keep these on note for, for later, was that I'm intensely suspicious of the argument that technology increases access to justice when it's used without a motivation uh, for that, that outcome. I've talked to many judicial administrations that say, well, when the brief is given to the uh, technology team, there's no mention of justice. It's about efficiency and cost saving and a mm -hmm. variety of other issues, which I think are, are challenges in themselves. I was going to swing back though to say, let's have a think about what Gregory and Michelle have just said about the potential changes in the way in which law is going to be, if you like, produced. In a world where a very large majority of people don't like lawyers uh, and are confused about the law. Um, if that's so, Rebecca, what can you uh, tell us about how this is going to impact on the way in which we train lawyers, the way in which lawyers understand what they're meant to do? And I'm particularly interested in, in your thoughts about it's not just all about code. We don't simply want a, uh, only one pathway, which is computational law and we forget about every other discipline. Am I right in, in, in that observation? Yeah, absolutely. And and thank you for the question and for having me back to talk about it. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been doing some research in Oxford, uh, which was UKRI funded. And the whole point of the research was to see how we can unlock the potential of AI for the legal profession generally. And my sort of section of that was looking at what that means for legal education and for the training of lawyers going forward. And what we did with, with a colleague, we conducted a whole series of interviews with legal service providers. And we said, you know, what are the things that you're seeing lawyers miss at the moment that then they don't have as skills that you think that they need as skills to be able to, to deal with this world that, that we're all entering? And through the, all the interviews, we, we found five different things that they all identified. And the first one absolutely picks up on what Gregory was saying before. We called it mindset understanding, but it was exactly that translation gap. It was the ability of lawyers and computer scientists to understand the thought processes of the other discipline so that when they're having a conversation, they know where the other person is coming from and what their sort of framework of thinking is. And um, that was felt to be very much missing. We also found, um, to pick up on some of your points, Mark, that um, that lawyers were said, the legal service providers were telling us that lawyers um Obviously, they understand and think about things like the GDPR and when they're using personal data that belongs to a person. But what they don't necessarily realise is that sea of data that you referred to before, that every time they make a transaction, every time they enter something on the, the firm's system, all of that is also data which they don't think of as something that they can harness and then use for the benefit of the firm and for their clients. So they know when it's sort of personal data, but they don't think about that sort of metadata that they're handling all of the time. Um, nor do they necessarily, we were told, have the commercial awareness to be able to weigh the pros and cons of a particular system. So like we were just talking about then, you know, is it all about efficiency or are there other things that should go into the mix? And, and what's your overall commercial judgment taking into account all of those things? They, they didn't feel that lawyers had the skills to be able to make those kinds of judgments and make those kinds of balances. We were also told that lawyers are very good at solving problems the way they've always solved them. But what they're not very good at is standing back and going, why do I solve it like this? Is there another way that I could do this? You know, would there be another route? Could I get, could I build something or have somebody build something to help me do this thing that I'm doing? So that sort of agile thinking and that sort of design system thinking was very different from what lawyers are really programmed to do, which is just deal with things the way that they've always dealt them using the rules that, that they've always used to deal with those problems. And then obviously the other thing that we were told was that a sort of understanding of the law and ethics relating to digital technology as well was a, another area that it was felt that lawyers needed training in. So out of these interviews, we had these sort of five skills gaps that we'd identified. So what we've done here is to build a course um, which tries to address those skills gaps. So we teach lawyers and computer scientists in the same room. So it's for, it's open to students who are studying computer science, but also students who are studying law and, and they work together both in the classroom and we also give them a practical project to do. We give them either NLP or blockchain technology and in small interdisciplinary groups and say, build something. So we have four teams across the class and say, you know, go away and build something with this technology. And that obviously helps them to talk to each other. We do think explicitly in the classroom about what the differences in mindset are. What are, you know, when we both talk about code, and obviously both lawyers and computer scientists use the word code to describe their rules, but what are the differences between those things and, and what, you know, what does code as law mean? Because what, what are the differences and the gaps between those two things? 
But we also think about, um, as we put it, both tech for law. So how is tech changing and, and supporting the legal system in the sorts of ways that we've talked about? You know, what are the trade offs in terms of justice and efficiency um, when we use tech to support the process of law very much as we've talked about it already this morning? But we also talk about law for tech. So how do existing areas of law need to change as the disputes that they regulate increasingly come from a digital context rather than from a, an interhuman context? You know, how do those rules need to change? And we go through a whole series of areas. So we look at algorithmic collusion as opposed to human collusion in competition law. So um, I look at how algorithmic decision making, as we were just saying, challenges the rules of public law. How do you bring the rules of public law and judicial review back to bear on a system when it's actually an algorithmic decision making system rather than a, a human adjudicator or or a human member of the executive and so on. So we go through a whole series of different areas of law. And that, I think, is something that I would like generally to, for as lawyers to, for us to build on. We do have the tools already in the form of things like public law to be able to regulate some of this technology. We do have those toolkits, but we need to work on building up those toolkits so that we can apply them to the new, the new digital context. And that's very much more about more than just, as you say, lawyers learning to code. It's lawyers learning what a computer science mindset is, learning what the challenges are, being able to have, we talk about making our students bilingual in the sense of being able to have an intelligent conversation with members of the other discipline. And then how do we use that to build on our existing toolkit so that we can then we can then make a contribution to regulating the areas? Okay, that's um, opened up another Pandora's box in relation to the things that we might want to interrogate in terms of legal training. I was just thinking too, in the traditional way of traineeships, the idea of having uh, a more senior lawyer training a junior lawyer to understand the mysteries of discovery or whatever it might be. Much of that really has to be looked at quite critically now. But I just take up on two things, which I'll pass on to, um, to Yulia, because I know she's interested in this. One is the concept of language, and I've worked with um, tech designers and, and innovators and with lawyers in the same room, and their misunderstandings of the most fundamental concepts are quite profound. You ask either of them what trust means, and a lawyer thinks trust is simply not getting caught. Uh, and the, um, that's very cynical, I know, but and the, the techie thinks it's all about safety. They don't have any understanding about the recipient community or what the recipient community might feel. They can't even reflect on the fact that a very large proportion of people didn't believe in uh, COVID-19 vaccination, even though it was safe. Uh, so there are factors in there that they just don't seem to get their hands around. And the other thing that I, I think is very important is misunderstandings, not just failure to understand. But we did a little project recently on IP and AI innovation. And IP lawyers thought that AI innovators like IP. And AI innovators have largely no interest in IP. They're interested in access, information access. And they only talk about IP when they have to go for a grant. Uh, and I think that that fundamental misunderstanding of the way in which we both work and the way in which we both think needs to be tackled as well. I know you're itching to say something, Rebecca, but I'll get you to hold on and pass over to Yulia. Just you raised something with me in a note that you sent to me earlier about the transformation of data in, and 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 let's say law as data into algorithms and making it an algorithmic science. In doing that, could I just ask you to think specifically about the fact that lawyers don't even know what data is. They don't know whether it's a legal entity or it's not a legal entity. They can't even cost it as private property. Uh, so we're in a sea of, of difficulty there if we want to make money out of data. Just give me some more of your thoughts about the way in which uh, legal thinking is heading in that direction. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, thanks already for all the contributions. Uh, they're very thought provoking and so great to uh, see you all back, actually. So it's it's uh, it's it's wonderful. So uh, starting from Mark's uh, observation, I would like to um, perhaps raise some uh, provocations based on what I've um, heard so far, uh, and perhaps also to um, to build really on the discussion that we had um, up to this point. So I think Mark pointed very nicely to the fact that essentially we're dealing with two different languages. 
the language of the law and the language of the data. Um, and what is quite peculiar about the language, which is, one, we can say, a manifestation of these two different fields, right, is that they intrinsically reflect the different functions that data, and now therefore AI, um, on the one hand, and the law, on the other hand, perform. So I think that um, when we try to think about the future of how data and the law uh, should interplay, we should go back to basics. Um, and uh, my argument, I think, is that to a certain extent, um, and of course, this is a matter of nuances and also a matter, a matter of, of values, after all, um, that I believe that uh, starting from Lessig's um, uh, quote, quote is law, well, in reality, quote should not be law. And I explain uh, this argument uh, very briefly. So uh, if we look at the functions of uh, the law and the functions of AI, uh, we can see a certain degree of, of overlap but also essentially we're talking about very different things. So when we conceptualize this relationship, I think uh, that the autonomy of the law that um, the different uh, contributions have directly or indirectly pointed out to uh, is something that uh, should be, uh, I think, really carefully um, um, considered. So uh, starting from the functions of, of AI and the law, a common feature, I think, is that of ordering. So both the law and AI have the power of ordering data uh, when we're talking about AI, and we uh, talk about the law, we uh, order society, we order people, um, and we order def uh, de um, as a consequence also the way of living uh, of a certain society. But then if we go further in analyzing what AI and what the law really seek to achieve, we're talking about two very different things. The um, uh, uh, data, AI systems um, systematized by finding connections through data, right? Um, they do that also by way of automation. But the law instead can create order by way of very different processes. Think about balancing. So the law orders people and orders um, society also through values. And the law also helps balancing, helps solving to a certain extent tensions uh, of different um, uh, values that permeate society. And through balancing, for example, we uh, achieve very creative solutions, solutions that are very powerful in many cases because they have sometimes also an equalizing power. Think about the principle of equality of non-discrimination, right? So in, in so doing, the law in a way interprets reality. And we can say that also AI systems interpret uh, data, uh, but again, the process through which uh, these two systems um, um, come about are very, very different. So in thinking about these two different um, worlds, think about uh, uh, these two different languages, then if we want to think about uh, the, uh, so to say the synergies between AI and data uh, and, uh, um, and law, um, well, the next step would be, can we transform the law into data and algorithm? And I think Mark uh, made a very uh, good point. Lawyers uh, don't really know uh, what data is. How can we uh, define data? So clearly there's, um, uh, there's an informational gap that uh, uh, I think Rebecca very nicely uh, pointed out. Uh, but even if we think uh, to, uh, so to say, fill this gap and uh, and therefore bridge these two worlds, uh, well, there are still some, some problems uh, in my view. Uh, and this is the fact that the technology, um, and I'll be very interested to, to hear the, the reaction on this point by, by Michel, the technology is not necessarily neutral. Think about data, right? Data intrinsically embodies bias. Uh, why? Because it builds on reality and therefore, uh, the data that we can collect about uh, legal systems is inevitably uh, uh, biased in a way because it reproduces only a part of what actually happens on the ground. It only reproduces part 
of the judgments, part of uh, uh, the, the law enforcement and so on. And this leads to bias. So I think that this is a, a, a significant problem when we try to alternate um, the law. And ultimately, in a way, by transforming the law into data, um, we would miss as well all the opportunities of the law. We might miss the opportunity of creativity. So Gregory was, um, I think, uh, uh, raising a very interesting point about sy systemic thinking rather than case-by-case -case thinking. But are we missing perhaps something by thinking uh, 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 about the law into, um, so to say, uh, uh, by conceptualizing the law into systems uh, only? Um, so I think that, again, we might uh, lose some, um, um, some of the power of the law. So just to conclude, um, I think that this doesn't mean, nevertheless, that the law and data uh, cannot cooperate. I really believe that there's power there and we should uh, look for uh, synergies. Um, there are some, so to say, limitations uh, as to whether we want to make a, a, a law into code and code into law um, for, as I said, uh, reasons that are technology, uh, technological in essence, so as I said, bias, but also think about the black box problem. There are some ways to overcome the black, uh, black box problem, but, but again, uh, this is partial. So we can, um, so to say, compare how a system operates and um, how a human operates in the same field um, to, to, to solve the black box problem. But again, explainability, um, very um, uh, hard to achieve in this context. Um, so wh where do I see the synergies? Uh, if we want to keep the autonomy of the law based on, on this discussion. I think that um, the potential really lies in um, empirical studies. I think that data and AI can make the law more transparent. So we need to start thinking about uh, data and AI not as a way to make the law less accessible and understandable because inevitably algorithmic regulation is opaque because of the bias problem, but also of the, of the black box problem. But we can perhaps use AI and data to make the law more transparent. And this therefore I think uh, is a great opportunity for, um, for legal uh, research in a way. Legal researchers should, uh, should perhaps see the potential of, of AI in this field. But then thinking about law as, um, as code, I think raises beyond the, uh, one can say, uh, the, a law that is less accessible and understandable, also issues of abuse of data power. So by transforming the law into code and code into law, I think that we might risk um, fostering and, and consolidating in a way the big tech market. And I think that this causes um, further imbalances in society. And ultimately we will make the law less human. We would um, uh, give prevalence to efficiency uh, and productivity uh, over a more human side of the law. I think what you've just done is encapsulated one of the frustrations that technologists have or scientists have when they look at the law. They say lawyers can't make up their mind. Do they want the law to be certain or do they want the law to be discretionary? Um, when I used to teach legal theory, the students would come away scratching their heads wondering which one is it? Uh, and it's very difficult, I think, if you uh, give a scientist who thinks in a binary way a tapestry-like law to understand its many faces and to understand that some jurisdictions are not even interested in truth, uh, then we have a complex problem. I think also underlying something that you've said and all the other speakers have said, there are fundamental moral questions that underpin how we approach technology as lawyers. And I think that that takes us back to Lessing's point that it's either about enclosing the world more because science can enclose, and lawyers do that very well, or opening up the world and giving a sense of freedom, which perhaps we might never have had. Now, uh, Marion's the, the last in the uh, list of presenters, which is a good place to be actually, because you can basically choose to say whatever you feel like. Um, and I know everyone now is itching to have a slice back after Marianne's had some time giving us her thoughts. So we will give Marianne the floor and then we'll have a free for all as to the points that you might want to respond to that others have raised. Marianne. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you very much all of you for uh, 
those uh, very interesting ideas and I will uh, really build on uh, the discussion we, we had now and, and some of, of my, my thoughts will uh, really uh, uh, echo what, what, you, what you said, I think. My, my understanding, Mark, of, of the discussion today is to try to go uh, beyond uh, the, the risk-based approach of uh, uh, AI governance that currently characterize uh, this, this field and maybe to, to adopt a, a, a sustainability-based approach. Um, the, the idea is, is uh, to consider that law is not and, and should not be just a constraint uh, for, for AI and, and digital technology. Uh, law can uh, support AI and really uh, enable it to participate in, in sustainability. And here I, I mean uh, in improving our daily life. Uh, and this include, of course, more protective uh, legal framework and, and fairer justice. And this, this uh, momentum for the future of legal ideas uh, here, um, th there is too many expressions and this really uh, echoes uh, um, a, a, a distinction that, that Rebecca made between law for tech and, and tech for law. Because here, what I see is that on the one hand, law and, and lawyers uh, can rely and maybe should rely more on AI and AI practitioners uh, to support uh, this, this uh, sustainability. And in the other hand, AI and AI practitioners uh, should also rely more on law. And here, uh, uh, I will uh, give you some concrete examples. So the idea you understand for me here is to show you that law and AI are not only in a tension uh, relationship, but uh, should be more in a supportive uh, uh, relationship. So first, uh, law should rely on AI uh, to support uh, uh, sustainability. And this uh, a dynamic, we already discussed it because it's, uh, of course, the general uh, context of uh, uh, digitization of, uh, of social relations. And here uh, uh, we know, and we, we already uh, had example this morning of AI techniques uh, designed uh, to be within the law with the objective to better protect uh, uh, people. And uh, the first example I, I have in mind um, here, so the law uh, uh, is within the, the, the implementation of the technology, um, is the, the very famous uh, UK's children code. I, I, I guess you, you know it. This is described uh, as an age appropriate design code. And this uh, uh, um, tool contains uh, several uh, technical standards that online services and of course uh, uh, services provider need to follow to protect the best interest of the child online. So in that context, AI can be used, for instance, to detect uh, the user, uh, uh, whether the user of the digital uh, service is the right age to access uh, this service. And it, in my opinion, it could be one good example to fill the translation gap uh, that uh, Gregory, you mentioned uh, previously. Um, Regarding my uh, uh, second dynamic, so AI should rely more on law, so the other way around now, to support uh, sustainability. Uh, here, this, uh, this statement uh, uh, relied on legal pluralism that was also mentioned by, by Gregory. So the assumption that normative regulation is not solely uh, uh, based on hard state law. Uh, uh, but on the contrary, there is a diversity of norms, including uh, um, non-state norm. Um, and this legal pluralism is really important in, in digital and AI uh, governance uh, to better protect people. And uh, I know that this view is not uh, fully shared here, as, as um, Michel told us, and I, I know it already, uh, he feared this privatization of, of norm. But uh, it's true in this context, 
AI practitioners and the industry in particular often fear hard law and see soft law uh, such as ethical principles, for instance, for responsible AI uh, as the better way to regulate. Otherwise, uh, AI could uh, blocked, be, be blocked by, by the law, for instance, um, but yet legal pluralism implies a normative dialogue. And uh, uh, Jul uh, Julia, you, you talk about cooperation. That's the same idea here. We need a normative dialogue and trust between these different normative fora and normative levels. And uh, in that respect, uh, I can give you two short examples. The first one uh, it is a concept you may know of, of AI regulatory sandboxes. Um, the, this concept, it's, it's a tool uh, allowing AI practitioners to experiment with uh, new products and services under a regulator's supervision. So on the one hand, uh, AI designers are encouraged to uh, develop and tether in other innovation in, in real life environment, but also supervised environment. And in the uh, other hand, uh, it, it will allow regulators to better understand the technology. So we really have here a kind of, of cooperation and this uh, uh, AI regulatory sandbox concept is introduced in the uh, EU AI Act proposal. Another important example uh, of that uh, dynamic is AI standards. Um, I refer here to voluntary technical requirements developed by standardization bodies such as uh, ISO or IEEE. Uh, just to remind you, standards should traditionally reflect public interests, so such as health and safety, consumer protection, uh, um, environmental uh, protection. And you may know that in AI domain, we already have uh, uh, standards adopted, in particular within uh, ISO, we have an I, uh, AI risk management standard. But if you look at it, uh, the requirements set out in this standard are fairly general and not very demanding for uh, AI providers. Therefore, uh, hard law should reinforce these requirements. So this is exactly, I, I, I think, the rationale of the European harmonized standards on AI that are currently developed within uh, the European Union in support of the future uh, AI Act. But it's not easy in practice strengthening the, the level of requirements, of course, in favor of more uh, human protection creates clear tension among stakeholders. But we need to go on with this uh, a normative uh, dialogue and, and cooperation. So I think this is really uh, the way forward. Thank you. Excellent. I was just um, perplexed by Zoom for a moment. I think I'm over Zoomed. Um, you've actually opened up a really interesting area, and I'm glad you went back to the discussion of governance because that is part of the reason that we're here. Um, I was just thinking if Emile Durkheim was alive now and he was talking about the conscience collective, where would law necessarily be in his analysis? Uh, you would be familiar with the argument that it is the boundary within which we can do many things and we can push that boundary as far as we like, provided the uh, collective conscience is in that direction. Um, I did a recent piece of research on AI dependency and the simple reality is that we live in a world like it or not now, which is massively dependent on AI and data. Uh, and so law is operating to some extent within that reality. Uh, the other thing I was going to observe, and this is no criticism, uh, that the panel is all European, including Rebecca, I'm sure, uh, who would admit to that. Uh, and because of that, you live under the, uh, the gentle hand of the GDPR or the pall of the GDPR, whichever it might be. And I actually blame uh, personal data protection to some extent because it's become the sort of cutting edge of the way law gets into the governance discussion and because of that it's often seen 
particularly by those outside the law, as being something which is punitive, regressive, and not something which is necessarily uh, stimulating uh, responsible access. Now, I think that that's most probably an unfair criticism, particularly living in a world now um, where I am, where there's virtually no regulation at all of anything when it comes to technology. Uh, and the scientists in Europe look wistfully at Asia saying, why couldn't we operate like that? Uh, could I just pose this to all of you and then you can say whatever you feel like, I'm just putting this up as an idea. Um, <clears throat> we are, I think, going to experience in the next 12 months a rebirth of legal regulation when it comes to AI, and that may be much harder uh, than the sort of soft ethics that we've been looking at over the last decade or so. Reasons for that could take us into another uh, three or four hours discussion, so I won't open that up. But uh, are we, in fact, um, looking down the barrel of much more hard law when it comes to governance? And do we think necessarily that that's going to encourage uh, what Marion was just talking about quite nicely, the idea of sustainable governance environments rather than governance environments that are uh, that are all about the language rather than the normative frame? That's just a broad question to all of you, but you could ignore it and uh, intervene in whatever way you feel. I might go to Michelle because you were singled out a couple of times by others, um, and I'm sure you have a view that you would like to correct their uh, assumptions about you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think um, regarding what you just said, uh, apparently the uh, the European the European Commission will publish something, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks or before the summer. It is said so because we are already in, in the summer. Uh, it shouldn't take long on virtual spaces, so it won't be a regulatory initiative, but just to to start uh, to to uh, to set the scene for um, uh, discussions and future uh, proposals. Something will come on the NFTs uh, after the European elections uh, of 24. So waiting for the next uh, the next uh, next commission. Uh, uh so uh the, the this yeah more more will come and to a large extent uh, uh i think this this gives a lot of work to lawyers in-house non-in-house lawyers and so on because uh in the end you know these are uh these are norms that uh, uh everyone should uh, uh comply with well uh, you mentioned the gdpr and it's, it's interesting to just this very short story in 2014 we organized a conference here in Lyon on the, the notion of person in uh, European law. And we had the head, uh, the director of fundamental rights of the European Commission, okay? And it was not supposed to talk about GDPR. The G GDPR was under preparation. Uh, uh, but uh, it mentioned the fact that this was, you know, the... Uh, a huge piece, legislative piece, uh, underway, and that uh, it was not only about protection of privacy and sound, but it was about sovereignty. And and so, uh, you know, um, I think this this is a part of the story. If we if we look at what happened uh, in in the field of uh, data protection, okay, we know that uh, until the GDPR. Uh, the, the market and the, you know the private companies could do uh, anything they they uh, they wanted. So um, uh, well, I agree with the fact that uh, um, the the soft laws approach and internally uh, the fact of uh, bringing um, some of the rules uh, into the companies uh, uh, and make sure that they comply is part of the picture. Uh, but the GDPR again is a very good example because uh, we see that uh, a, you know a quite strong enforcement of the rules make uh, makes uh, um, the entire the entire uh, framework the, the entire environment uh, safer for uh, uh, for uh, consumers for citizens and so on and I don't see any alternative than 
you know, strong enforcement and systematic enforcement uh, of uh, the the rules that we we enact uh, in order to to make sure that uh, um, we 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 you know still live in a, in a context where uh, basic rights are uh, um, re respected. Uh, and again, I think Mario knows that I'm not a fan of uh, standardization, but uh, probably because I don't know enough about it. But uh, I think again that uh, the the legal rules or legal categories and the hierarchy of norms and so on should still uh, and even more shape uh, you know the, the technological developments and not the other way around. Um, uh, and so it requires, uh, as Rebecca says, and, and uh, the other panelists as well, it requires to to understand sufficiently what is going on. But uh, but my impression in the past years is that you know uh, the technology is shaping uh, it's shaping you know in the end the 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 legal rules and and the codes and uh, you know I think we should be in capacity to reverse it. <laughs> Let me jump in and say something provocative and allow the rest of you to get in too. Um, about 70% of the world, I would guess, don't live in private space and their notion of privacy and even individual integrity is somewhat different from what uh, we privileged people might otherwise see. The Chinese will legislate some um, regulations on uh, data control next year and that will have nothing to do with individual rights it will be about the state controlling data. Uh, I suspect that the points that have been raised in favour of uh, legal intervention are arguably very important, uh, but there are other realms out there, I think, that need to be engaged with. There was a question in, the, in the, the chat, which I might just answer quickly, which says, can we give an example of a sustainable government environment? I think sustainability depends on what you're trying to govern and where you're trying to govern it. Uh, I've just been involved in some research on what we call digital self-determination. And digital self-determination is a soft regulatory realm, but it's designed to promote the interests of the data creator uh, and to make people realize that even the big powerful data um, storers will be willing to open up as um, open banking has shown and open finance looks like it's showing on the basis of what they get out of it and they get reputational value they get better quality data blah 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 uh, so and that's not something that's uh, a state initiative at all although it may may require the state to assist it uh, so that the obligations that are within that notion are better respected but that's again another discussion on its own there are some um, what we'd call quasi-legal regulatory frames and some independent regulatory frames that are designed for a sustainable environment as well as what we uh, look for in personal data protection. Um, the rest of you, who wants to have a slice of the, of the time with any issue that might have been raised so far? Uh, Gregory, you've got a hand that looks like it's halfway up. Yeah. Uh, go for it. Okay, so it's, I would like to, 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 to bring an additional aspect. I mean, uh, I completely disagree with a lot of stuff that we have said, like, for instance, that we have, been, for instance, this idea that we have the private to recast again the discussion we have today in the private versus the public. I think it's a very bad framing. It's a bad framing because, in fact, and it, we have seen that already with the internet, there is an invisible handshake between tech technology and, and states uh, and the public sector, because what technology bring is a way to have control on people that we never experienced before. And that was always the interest of the state to have more control on people. Uh, so if uh, you look at the developments that we can see is that in fact, there is something for the market and for big companies, and there is something for the states to control more citizens and to have, and that's also the idea of, of the, to a certain extent, to the rules as code, is that then we will have an alignment that is better, we can control more, we can automatic control, 
and and that means we 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 will have a kind of automatic law. So the idea to recast the way like the the the, the question like this, I think it's dangerous. For I mean the the very idea of having something like a civil society uh, <laughs> that is independent from the market and from and from the state. Uh, because what we are experiencing, uh, if I do tap a little bit in philosophy, uh, you you remember pr probably uh, Habermas, Luhmann, and other kind of uh, uh, people from um, in the, the 70s, 80s, explaining that what society is, is communication. I think there is something interesting in that, because what uh, the digital transformation means to a certain extent is that we are trans transforming the very core of our society, of the, 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 the world of where we are living in, into a grid. It means that we, ha we'll have, a, we have a grid that is there and that, uh, um, that has all the information and all the communication between everybody inside. So that means that the one that control the grid control everything. Uh, and, and there, I think there is a problem that a GDPR is nothing about that, is that there is no more room for secrecy. So, uh, and for I mean, uh, an independent civil society that is not the state nor the market. So, so, so uh, I think that's, that, I mean, what I'm looking for is how the law, how law can, contribute to build that again. And if it's not that, then I think the connection between law and technology can work really well together because law is, uh, is, is, uh, can really adjust to having some kind of automation, uh, can really adjust to having big players or using technology to uh, do some kind of, not only contract review, but contract implementation, finding agreements between, between parties for a deal. So I think that is the question. And that's where I think technology, I mean, it's not, you know, that is not mine, but technology is no good, no bad. No, it is neutral. And the way it's not neutral is because it changed. We, we can still have the same discussion but before, but it changed the very basic structure, the, the infrastructure of our society. And for this, uh, and this will change anyway the the way we are building questions because we cannot build questions the same way as soon as the old communication in society is on the grid. So. Can I jump in and, and ban any further discussion about the neutrality of technology because that could divide us uh, and I don't think there's any solution to that problem. But I want to shift actually out of something that you just threw into the mix, Gregory, and suggest that we are facing the challenge of new law, whatever we think about it. There's got to be a new way of looking at law. And unfortunately, lawyers spend an awful lot of time looking backwards instead of looking forwards. Um, it, it, we are aware, if we've got any um, for, foresight, that the division between public and private now, law is very murky. Uh, if you have private companies delivering public services through super apps using public data and private data, then you can't have the company hiding behind a, pub, a private contract. Uh, but that's what the market would tell them that they could do. So that there is a, a challenge there for lawyers. Um, we have a massive generation of unauthorized downloaders out there, challenge to IP and IP thinkers. Um, and I love teasing my IP lawyer friends about that, that if we want to have an IP that is actually relevant, uh, then why don't we get out there and show people what it should be? Um, I'm wrestling with this new law problem currently in a, a, a book that I'm writing, and I'd be most interested to know what your views are about what do we think the new challenges should be? Agrivi's just suggested one, and that is the reconceptualization of the community. Uh, what is society? Where does society live? And how should law order that? Um, law has spent an awful lot, I can see you, Julia, and I'll put you straight in. Uh, law has had uh, perhaps too much time looking at private property over the last century, and it might need to, to look seriously now at other forms of ordering 
so it doesn't get left in the backwater. Uh, Julia, what would you like to add? Yes, uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. And um, um, perhaps precisely, um, uh, first of all, I'm looking forward to your book. Um, I, I'll be really curious to... Um, uh, to, to I'm looking it. forward to it too. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, I'm looking for, you know, I, 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 I'm really curious to read uh, what are your thoughts on, on this issue. But I think that the discussion um, is really uh, is becoming more intricate in the sense that um, in a way I agree and I both agree and disagree uh, with both uh, Grigory and, and Michelle and I'd explain why in the sense that um, I I absolutely share the view of, of Gregory that um, and also uh, Mark's point just earlier on that Cooperations between um, um, public and private have always existed. Uh, think about all the literature on public-private partnerships, but also these more informal cooperations uh, that have no, for um, in a way, they have no acknowledgement into uh, a contract. Um, think about Google simply providing um, uh, to schools uh, uh, Google Education or um, any other company that simply uh, supports, for example, state functions. Uh, also think about the military uh, operations, right? We've seen that big tech have, have offered their um, um, services for, for very core public um, functions. But um, so this has always happened. But at the same time, I side also with Michelle on the point that this is this may be problematic. And I would like to raise, for example, one area where I think that um, uh, this tension is really uh, uh, is really key. And it's, um, so to say, we really have a clash of way to um, um, conceptualize these, these corporations and also what value should um, govern them. And this is really the core actually of, of the project, uh, DG Public Values that, that I'm working on. Um, Trade secrets. Uh, clearly, this is an area where um, there's there's a clash. Inevitably, companies don't want to share the algorithm, don't want to share the data because this is um, protected by trade secrets. But at the same time, uh, that very um, algorithm, that very data that has been used to uh, fit the algorithm would reveal uh, perhaps quite a lot about um, these systems, how they work, what kind of problems they may have, any bias, any um, any issue. Because I think that going back to how AI is reshaping the world, I don't think that um, AI is coming for us and AI will will um, extinguish human uh, um, the human race, right? I don't think that this is the risk of AI, and and I think that I I really like the idea of my own as well of of thinking about sustainable governance where perhaps we can merge AI and the law, but but inevitably uh, there, there are still risks. And I think the biggest risk of AI system is, is um, furthering uh, in a way, um, is, is consolidating data power and furthering bias and inequalities. And so even if we think that it's, it's true that technology is, um, uh, is changing society, and it would be very interesting to, to touch upon uh, the GDPR and um, uh, what has been the role as well of the GDPR um, in Europe, for example, in, in, in framing the discussion on, on technology. Um, but these inequalities are evident, not all individuals have access to AI tools and can shape the technology as well as the law. And I think that's that's a point that perhaps I think Michelle raised. And so, I mean, the discussion takes a very different direction when-, when could, I, could I leap in there and put Rebecca <laughs> on the spot and say, if you look at the question in the chat, it builds just on what uh, Yulia has been saying. Are we actually looking through ChatGPT and other technologies at ways that um, can pull the mask away from legal jargon and, and open up the possibility for uh, uh, true transparency in the delivery of law? Or are we simply just relying on something else uh, instead of relying on the lawyer that we used to trust? We now 
rely on the chat GBT that we now trust. Uh, my personal view is neither are most probably all that trustworthy, but what do you think? Um, so, uh, so, well, I, I agree with your your sense of lack of trust. And I, I think my concern about that is that I've heard this sort of suggested, oh, you know, chat GPT means that people will get answers and they can get them more directly and they can even get an explanation for them. And of course, that's not at all what they're getting. That's not what chat GPT does. It's literally just predicting the next most likely sentence. And so I very much share Julia's concern that actually what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to bake in all of our existing problems and package them to somebody in a in a way that looks like it's something that that might be reliable or might be in exchange for something that we have at the moment, but actually isn't that at all. Um, but I also would like to pick up, if I can, on the the discussion that we've been having about public and private, because that's also something I'm like, my background is a public lawyer, and I'm really interested in whether our existing definition of that divide between public and private really holds. And I don't, I don't think it does. And sort of a corollary of, of um, what Gregory and, and Julia were saying, perhaps, is that as well as as well as understanding more about the relationships between state and, and big tech, one of the things we might think about doing is about using the tools that we currently have for controlling the state in order to control big tech as well. If we think that one of the sort of essences of the application of public law is the imbalance of power between the state and the private citizen, well, you see exactly that imbalance of power um, in the tech context. And as Julia says, it's, it's really sort of baked into that, that tech context. So I would like to see more use of our existing toolkit that we use for controlling the state in the form of administrative law in its various different forms in different countries being brought to bear against the, the imbalance of power that we have between the individual and some of these big tech companies. And what that is, I think, is a sort of counterexample to some of the other approaches we've talked about. We talked about the sort of big, overarching, top-down GDPR, AI Act, you know, let's do everything all at once kind of approaches. And that would very much be the opposite. It would be a sort of bottom-up, what tools do we have already for addressing a harm of injustice, you know, lack of transparency, lack of accuracy, abuse of decision-making power? Well, the tools we have are public law, so let's grow from the bottom up, from our existing smaller set of rules, into something that, that might be able to control these this imbalance of power between big tech and, and the citizen. Yeah, and if you look at that in terms of the way in which chat groups control bad behaviour in virtual communities, they're not relying necessarily on complicated legal devices. They're going to a bottom-up banishment uh, exclusionary process, which is a, a fairly primitive way of exercising civil power, but it has great, great influence. Uh, in fact, I worked in the South Pacific for many years and the Western Samoans have lived off a culture of just doing that quite well. Um, I agree. I think that there are lots of hidden techniques that are already existing in the law that would be useful for governance. But I'm wondering, moving away from the governance point for a moment so that we can think about a more proactive uh, approach for the relationship between tech and law, I do believe that there is an argument now to say that technology gives um, new opportunities for individuals to engage and communicate. Obviously, it can deny those opportunities too, but it does. And so we might be looking now at a platform where law becomes a more communal device, a more community-based experience, rather than something that's reliant only on whether you can afford uh, to be a contracting party or whatever it might be. How does the panel think about that? The idea, of it's, it's more than democratising, I think, even though that's important. I think it's about the idea of where does the individual data subject, where does the individual uh, user sit in all of this, uh, particularly in a society now where those under the age of 30 are digital natives largely and they understand how this all works. What do you think? Do you think that we're actually on the cusp of a new form of empowerment rather than being restricted towards a situation of disempowerment? Marianne, you're nodding sagely at me. What do you think? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Mark. I think you, you really point out a, a very important uh, a trend that this empowerment uh, uh, trend based on different tools that can really enable uh, uh, private users or consumer digital citizen to um, be um, more independent of the choices online. And I think we have a lot of different um, 
initiatives on, on that uh, topic. And it, I can uh, also make the link with the, the concept of, of self-determination that you mentioned previously, because I think that's uh, um, um, an expression of this self-determination. And I, I have some, some uh, concrete examples uh, uh, in mind. For instance, um, uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, tool called uh, Claudette, that's uh, uh, an application developed uh, by, by Professor Sator in, in uh, the uh, Florence uh, European uh, Institute in order to help consumers to check the compliance of, uh, of um, uh, web uh, uh, sites with a consumer protection. So that's a, a European uh, law-based uh, uh, index. But of course, you can replicate uh, those kind of, of tools uh, on different uh, jurisdictions. So I think that really uh, he's here a very important avenue, as you said, to uh, uh, strengthen uh, the, the autonomy of, of individuals uh, uh, online. And I think it's, it's a very important uh, element. And I think we, we can imagine not only tools to be used by individual users, but we can also imagine tools directly developed by company, by tech company, for instance, to um, uh, make uh, like uh, self uh, compliance in order to respond also to uh, uh, consumer protection, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the future clients. So it could be, uh, I, I think, a global, uh, uh, a general, a more general uh, uh, tendency. Yeah, I, I would. Um add one other example. I was talking to some people who were involved in a very interesting use case in India dealing with disabled communities and the way in which virtual space enabled disabled people if the technology was sensitive to their disability. Uh, and this was quite exciting because the, uh, the uh, tech community was working with disabled populations to tailor uh, options for them, uh, which uh, went right around the the sort of usual market imperatives and and towards what a specific community wants. And in India, for example, this is a very uh, large but also an extremely active community, particularly amongst feminist uh, communities. Um, the whole question of uh, the integrity of the body and the representation of the body in the virtual is uh, very exciting to see growing out of very grassroots bases. Um, I want to swing back before I give everyone a shot at whatever they feel like they want to say, uh, just to go back to something that Gregory was mentioning earlier, and that was that perhaps um, the relationship between law and technology relates to the community in which that challenge exists. So in the in the finance sector, for example, there seems to be, as Gregory said before, a bit of a rush away from uh, re relying on litigation and looking more towards compliance. But there are some communities where, in fact, the move is the other way. Um, I wonder whether it's a very community specific issue, the way in which technology is impacting on the delivery of, of satisfying legal services. What do you think, Gregory? No, I, I'm quite sure that it depends. Uh, there is not, nothing like one size can fit all. Uh, and of course, you have a very important uh, context is really important. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, sometimes it's uh, technology can bring more dispute. <laughs> Uh, sometimes uh, it, it can work um, a little bit differently. Uh, and to react a little bit to what Marion was uh, mentioning, uh, and to give some kind of concrete, some kind of concreteness to this idea of rules as code and circulation of legal solutions, because I think that's 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 a huge development today. Because we we we, are, we were discussing today a lot of really high level uh, legal discussions, but so with two kind of limits, of course, uh, law is not mainly about that. It's mainly about small transactions between people, etc. 
And uh, a lot of the time people use, including lawyers, they do not they use the law as building blocks to create some stuff. They know that really well in finance. We, we, people believe they buy financial product, but in fact they sign a contract, but they do not speak about the contract anymore. They, they buy a product. Uh, so uh, if you look at what's going on with uh, e-commerce, et cetera, et cetera, the thing is that I think people get, because you decide on different platforms because you know what the platforms will do, like what will be the relation with the plumber if you use this tech instead of this one? Of course, in, in, the, in the platform, you will have some rules, some legal rules, some insurance, etc. But all is included and it's only one product. You use this one, you make the contract with the plumber. If there is a problem, you know what will happen. There is an escrow system, there is not an escrow system, etc., etc. And that is, I think, can be, and I mean, I think it's all it's already a big thing. And that is what make people convinced that it's better to rely on technology that integrate, of course, some legal. Uh, some some legal contract, etc., because they know what will happen there next, and that's something they don't know when they sign just a contract, because in fact they don't understand the contract, they don't understand what it means, and they do. Uh, they the only thing they potentially know is that they, if they have, need to go to court, to the court, it will cost a lot of money, probably more than the money they need to do the repair. <clears throat> I'm thinking too about a situation, Gregory, where, and this is open to everyone, where the excesses of law can be resisted by technology. I was thinking about Bikram Yoga, actually, and the way that Bikram used uh, litigation to pursue a rather problematic copyright claim, which was eventually resisted by people who just realized they could get access to his breathing techniques by going onto the web. Uh, and so they uh, just created this groundswell of it doesn't matter what you claim, we can get what we want anyway. I wonder whether that possibility for active resistance to, let's say, some of the negative sides of law is important to think about. I, I'll just move on. Two points I want to make before I go around the room for five minutes. One is a selfish question. Uh, can anyone or everyone tell me what they think will be the place of law in the metaverse in a sentence or two? And I'll tell you why I want to know in a minute. Does anyone have a quick sentence or two about what law will be or what law is going to be in the metaverse? Too shy. Uh, if if I can jump in, Mark, I will I will not be very bold, but I want to respond. Uh, my point is 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 very traditional, maybe uh, as a thinking. So I apologize already, but I think we need to stick to the idea that there is no duality like a digital uh, jurisdiction uh, separated from our traditional physical legal order. So, and I can, of course, uh, apply this idea to the metaverse. So my point is you understand that our uh, uh, jurisdiction, being the EU jurisdiction or, or another one, our legal order fully applies to the metaverse. So yeah, there it's are two, cliche, there are two. but it's very important to recall it. And if you read a lot of uh, uh, current um, uh, human rights uh, blueprint, or, or soft law uh, uh, human rights uh, declaration within the cyberspace, one uh, uh, repeatedly uh, provision is all the rights, fundamental rights that people enjoy in the physical world uh, offline apply the same way online. So I think well, that, it's that, that is, for me that very is a, important. Yeah, I think that's right insofar as a normative argument goes, but there's often the reverse said, which is if you don't have jurisdictional enforcement in a virtual space, then you can claim whatever rights you like, but you can't action them. Now, I'm, I agree with you. I don't think that there should be any, um, if you like, uh, reduction in the importance of 
uh, the law that we know. But I think it does require those who, who advocate that position to firstly say there isn't a substantial difference, real space, virtual space. And if they can establish that, then say, well, what do we do with enforcing those things that we value? Um, but I, I see your point. And, and I, I suppose the only, well, there's a number of reasons why I raised it, but uh, my primary reason is just to get that argument in favour of the relevance of law, wh whichever way we want to di direct it. Uh, Rebecca was nodding too. Are you putting the same view or are you putting an edge on that view? Yeah, no, very, very similar view. I mean, if you commit an offence in, you know, online, it's still an, a criminal offence and you can still be prosecuted for it. And I think I think that's the key thing. And we've seen it with um, situations like the Dow blockchain, you know, the idea that actually something can can take on a life of its own and, and it won't ever need to refer to law and then things go wrong and you need to refer to law. It's very difficult, quite rightly, to exclude the application of law and, and law will always apply to these concepts. What we might need to do to go back to our sort of law for tech idea is we might need to adjust some of the concepts that we use. So some of the definitions that we use in statutes and so on might need to be adapted very slightly to make it clear that they apply in a digital context as well. You know, concepts of damage, for example, we need to think about what does that mean digitally as well as physically, but it can be done. It can absolutely be done. And I think that's I, would, I would argue, though, that it's not a slight adaption. I think that there might be some areas where the adaption has to be really quite radical. If I want to put clothes on my avatar uh, and those clothes, I want to be on that avatar and not taken by anybody else. I can't use standard private property thinking to do that because the clothes are pixels and the best I can argue is for a license of some sort which is yet to be properly formulated. Now I, I listen to and I hear both your points and I think they are strong arguments but it is also a realm for legal creativity that I think we need to be out there pushing uh, the regulatory relevance of law and I don't think we can effectively do it just simply by saying well it should be so which is not what you're saying, I'm sure. Um, yeah, uh, Gregory was shaking his head too, because I know he has a particular view on this, but I'll, I'll keep you off it for a second. Um, let's go around the room and see, just to tie up, because we've got a, a few minutes left on. There is a, a question in the chat directed towards Rebecca, who, sh who might deal with it offline, I think, because it's specifically about your area of expertise, and I'm sure you can answer it quite well. Um, Let's go around the room with anything we want to get off our chest. Uh, and then I'll go to Eva if she's got a question or something she wants to tie up. Uh, and then we'll just bask in our own brilliance, I think, uh, for what has been a really stimulating panel. Um, let's start the other way around. Marion, is there something that you would observe that you have uh, been interested in, in the discussion or something you want to clarify? Thank you, Mark. Maybe uh, I, I would like to come back to the digital sovereignty uh, concept mentioned by Michel, because I think it's it's a very good uh, example uh, within our topic of future of legal ideas. Because uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, 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 Michel, at that time, before the GDPR uh, uh, get in, into force, uh, it was seen already as, as a tool to, to strengthen uh, 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 sovereignty, digital sovereignty, but what does it mean? And it's clear that for uh, uh, public law lawyers, I'm not, but uh, uh, in a classical way, sovereignty, it's only for states, but it's very clear that such a legal idea, in my opinion, is, is really not appropriate anymore. And we really need to adopt a holistic approach of digital sovereignty. I think it's a very important um, um, a development. What I mean with holistic approach is that digital sovereignty is not only for states now, but it's also uh, for tech companies. We have no choice. They are part of the game and also for individuals. And I think digital sovereignties based on this holistic approach could really be, um, I mean, uh, an interesting uh, infrastructure to think forward uh, uh, the regulation and, and the, the governance of, of cyberspace. Before That's I turn my, to my Michelle, point. You, you've just thrown down the gauntlet to public international lawyers who can't seem to get their heads out of nation states. Um, I would be interested in your response, Michelle, because I see that your uh, thinking on sovereignty is quite broad. And I think some of the old Austinian notions, the sort of traditional separation of powers hasn't necessarily helped us 
to try and get a new notion of sovereignty that's, that's more than just saying, this is mine, I can, you know, claim it and keep it. Because we, as we know, data sovereignty is a deeply problematic notion to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, idea, um, uh, Marion. Well, listening to, 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 to you, Mark and, and Marion, uh, and Gregory, and to you all, well, first, I think that as Julia says, said, uh, the issue of values, you know, uh, even if, you know, it's a bland statement, but uh, still makes a lot of sense. So, you know, in order to, to fuel the, the system with values, you know, someone has to, to you know, to be in command of uh, what is going on. And, and um this decentralization of uh, of uh, uh, values enforcement or values definition is not probably the the best way to approach uh, the issue maybe uh, the, the the notion of empowerment uh, is of course interesting and i think the collective empowerment of uh, of uh, you know, consumers, citizens uh, um, will probably be a, a quite interesting uh, topic in the coming months and years. I, I don't know if you had the opportunity to see what were the responses of the big tech companies uh, to the consultation of the European Commission regarding the AI liability directive proposal and the new PLD product liability directive. What they were concerned with uh, was not you know the content of the rules and so on or whatever the standard of liability they were concerned by the collective redress uh, actions by consumer organizations so this is what they fear okay uh, this is what is now into application in all the member states of the european union since uh, friday or saturday i think so I think if we want to think in terms of community, of individual empowerment and so on, th this should uh, probably be strongly connected with these uh, collective redress mechanisms and using AI and data by these consumer organizations or citizens organizations in order to, to make sure that the rules are uh, enforced uh, can be an interesting trend. Uh, as long as you know the communities, the consumers, the citizens decide to empower themselves, which is not always the case, unfortunately, due to the you know life on social networks, uh, fake news, and stuff. Because you know people tend to be less engaged. Uh, uh, this is my uh, uh, my point of view, uh, but I, I, I'm probably wrong. Uh, uh, in France recently, you know, the, uh, a book has been published by Jacques Attali. You probably don't know the guy, but he, he was, uh, you know, an advisor to François Mitterrand <laughs> back in the 1980s. Uh, in, in, his, in his book, something he says is that, uh, of course, big private companies, you know, want to privatize uh, the production of norms uh, and the norm normative oh. power. So, so... I'm not saying he is right, but this is apparently a, tr a global trend. And you probably read the, the Henry Kissinger uh, interview, you know, uh, when he turned uh, 100 years old. And it, one of his major focus apparently was the fact that uh, the USA and China should probably reach an agreement in order to have a non-proliferation treaty, a global one, you know, on AI. So apparently the guy was seemed to, uh, a bit concerned about uh, the developments in AI. In France, a topic and a word that has been popular in the past weeks, and Marion will pro and the others will probably uh, have heard, is decivilization. You know, the fact that civilization seems to uh, not to move forward anymore, or could go backwards to a certain extent, and it could be that AI and data, you know, uh, depending on how they are used, could. Uh, lead to I'm not I, I don't agree necessarily with the concept, but uh, we should be uh, uh, careful and and uh, well um, uh, focus on on these trends as well. And to conclude, um, 
I think uh, listening to our discussions, there might be a risk also of some tribal laws, you know, in this future uh, world of, uh, you know, uh, virtual realities, blended realities. And I, I don't think that tribal, a tribal approach to, to regulation, you know, would be a progress uh, according to where we, we stood and where we stand um, at the moment. I think the biggest problem, thanks for that uh, segue, the biggest problem with uh, decivilization and the concept of tribalism is ultimately that we forget that in tribal settings, there still exists power hierarchies and those power hierarchies are often patriarchal and very cruel. Uh, but I do think that there is a need to recognize the grassroots uh, possibilities, let's say. Um, I was talking to some people about uh, the possibility of big tech being more open with secondary use. And tech says, well, we can't do it, it's too expensive. Information looping can allow you to do it for virtually nothing. Uh, and I think it's time for the, uh, for the users to be a bit more aggressive in what they, what they expect. Rebecca, what do you think? So um, I, I very much enjoy hearing these these ways in which um, we can think about re-empowering people because I, I very much, as we were, Julia and I were saying earlier, I very much have the concern that this is going to lead to disempowerment and you know aggravation and exacerbation of existing inequalities. So anything that can be done, I think, to 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 counteract that, I think, is always sort of makes me feel more optimism. And um, obviously, there is, I think, a key role for lawyers in that process. So we were talking just before um, this round about the need to develop the existing law that we have. Um, in our system, it has typically been more successful when that's happened. So when when existing rules and tools have been used, as opposed to the creation of new tools, that has tended, at least in the UK's experience, to be more successful um, as a route to doing it. And, and in a sense, that's good news for us because we already have those tools. And so using them in that kind of way to support these kinds of movements and, and to give people the, the sort of redress and the sort of accountability that I think they're looking for is, is very much a role that I think lawyers can play. And just to return to, to what we were saying at the outset, Set. Obviously, the process of doing that, the, the process of making sure these tools do apply in the digital world is bound to be a very interdisciplinary one. And so the more we can talk across law and tech boundaries as we do that, I think the better. OK, the clock's ticking, so I'll have to tie you last two down. Um, Julia, you mentioned in some of the notes that you sent to me that you're concerned with this tension between efficiency and humanness. I like that idea. Um, is there something you might tell me about your thinking on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that um, to, uh, moving back to the point of, of, of values in a way, um, clearly uh, AI is general space in the sense that it can make our lives uh, much more efficient, in particular also the, the legal field, um, but at the same time, we also need to uh, bear something in mind that um, with the advancement of the technology, then at some point, um, some uh, tasks, some um, uh, parts of our, our everyday life, our everyday jobs, even the legal pro profession could be replaced. Um, which could be good or bad, depending how, how we look at it. But then the point would be, why, why do we have lawyers? <laughs> so um, I think that um, uh, there's a, um, a, a thin uh, line uh, here um, between enhancing efficiency and uh, keeping humanness in, 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 in society. Um, uh, because inevitably, this, uh, this discussion, I think, touch, touched upon very interesting points, automated law and, um, and, and the potential of AI. And I agree that AI can be used in absolutely um, fantastic ways. And uh, I myself um, was involved in a project uh, on um, strengthening uh, the, the, the uh, voting rights of the, of the disabled um, in, in Europe. And inevitably, AI is considered to be one area where um, um, these, these rights could be strengthened. So there's a potential. But what I want to point out is that these projects are guided by public bodies. So I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think the point that you make about AI having that capacity, 
we have to recognise that long before AI, law was responsible as much for exclusion as it was for empowering. And so lawyers really need to have, uh, you know, to, go, to have gone over those value questions, I think, for themselves more clearly. Uh, Gregory, quickly, uh, law plug and play, um, how does that fit into any of this discussion? Because we haven't touched on it yet, and I think we should. Yeah, uh, thank you, yes. So to a certain extent, yeah, so what is the, the, the question of the future of ideas, of legal ideas? So uh, in, in a lot of, in a lot of, I mean, I think that in a lot of, of, uh, of domain, uh, we will have just law as a layer of the tech stack. I think that 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 is what we will have that we have already uh, in a lot of area. Even we, if we do not uh, focus at it uh, like this, and of course we have a law as a layer of uh, of a tech stack. Uh, it's a very huge change. So, uh, and in order to address that, I think that we have several problems. Uh, I mean, uh, one is that we need to be. I mean, lawyers need to be modest because. It's a very uh, this to integrate technology in the basically in the ecosystem as such because the more data we have, the more access to reality we have. Something with lawyers we never had. So we imagine that the world that society is is built on law, but that is not correct. Uh, in fact, it's a very small layer today, and we have mainly a pathological perspective on law because we look at the law when it goes to court, and all the rest, what people are doing concretely, we don't know. So now we have access to a lot of new information, how the judges are really deciding. We have access to what people are discussing, really, and how they interpret information. And then we have, oh, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, misleading information online. And people are all complotists, etc. But it was the same before in the pub on the corner of the street. But no, we have, no, we have access to it. And I think there is a huge risk of uh, over overregulation and overcompliance. Uh, in the direction we are going, if we want to have the law uh, as a mirror of society that was not and is not supposed to be, I mean, at least uh, that's 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 a belief. Then, I think we, 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 just last thing, uh, empowering people. I think it's really necessary if we have law as a, a plug-in. But the thing is that the more we regulate the technology. The more it will be difficult for for people to uh, be empowered to develop kind of civilian technologies because they have too many they have a lot of requirements and there there is a balance that needs to be fine. Exactly, and I you round off by saying something which Julia was shaking her head to quite positively. Yeah, you, know, you can't blame the machine, uh, and I think what we've got to do is know where law, in fact, can give space to positive technological advance. Uh, you also quite subtly rounded off with Teubner's global law and uh, a claim for legal pluralism again, which I think some of us would agree with, uh, others perhaps not. I'll give it to um, to Eva to round up and I'll just, uh, uh, from my point of view, say it's always a, a real privilege to work with scholars that I have uh, for the last couple of hours. Uh, very, very enjoyable time. Eva. Thank you, Mark. Uh, be before I thank you all, I have maybe a last uh, question um, to you all, because we talk about empowerment of citizens, and we've also talked a lot about uh, chat GPT, and we had the question in the chat, it's, it's an issue that um, occupies people's minds a lot. Um, so if citizens are using chat GPT at the moment, they have no idea that this is not a research engine. They don't know that, you know, the answers they get are, are can be blatantly false. They, the system can invent authors, can invent whole laws. Um, so the, I think there's a big confusion out there at the moment. The question is, do you think that we can fine tune a system like that in the next five to 10 years in a way that it becomes reliable? Can it be fine tuned in a way that it maybe replaces a judge in smaller disputes where there is no discretion? Um, what is your prediction for the use of that system uh, in the judicial decision making process? If anybody has a thought, very, very shortly, I think I think that uh, yeah, it can be fine tuned and uh, and be uh, 
very efficient, uh, by the way, even more efficient if you want. Uh, we know that in the domestic courts, you know, uh, most of the times where well, judges are very competent and sound, but sometimes, you know, they miss, especially in the European Union, uh, you know, the question of uh, direct effect, primacy and sound is not always still today, you know, very uh, well understood. So, yeah, I think it can bring uh, advantages. <laughs> So I would answer that sort of in, in two parts. I would say, can it be fine-tuned? Yes, we're already seeing, I think Gregory talked about that last time, we're already seeing it being fine-tuned and built on by law firms who are sort of turning it into their own tools. So yes, I think more can be done with it. Does that mean it can replace a judge? Much less likely for two reasons. Um, one is the fact that, and, and this picks up on, on other things that Julia and others have mentioned, which is that there's more to a judge than just whether they produce the right answer at the end of it. There's the so my colleague Linda Mulcahy has done all sorts of work on what the process of going through a court feels like and what people get out of that psychologically, in addition to the fact that they get an answer to their case at the end of it. You know, having one's day in court is, is a real thing that people have a psychological attachment to, which it's harder for a system to replace. And secondly, because like I was saying before, if you were going to replace a judge with an automated system, chat GPT or a chat GPT based system would not necessarily be your first choice. It's very good at what it does, but what it does is very specific. And it's not necessarily legal reasoning. And so, you know, any any other sort of classifier system might well be that was that was designed for the specific purpose of, of legal classification might do a better job, actually. Yes, if I may also intervene here, I I I, I don't know, but I mean we need uh, uh, to react right now as if in any case it will improve and it will be able to replace a judge or, or, or a lawyer. And what we need to do in that perspective is to build awareness and to develop guidelines based on use cases, how to use it. I think it's very important and we already have example, uh, a very, a very uh, concrete example within the European Commission. The European Commission has developed a, a guidelines for the civil servant of the European Union, how to use chat GPT or not within the, the EU law uh, uh, making process. So I think this is what we have to do. And the second element, uh, uh, I think also in that uh, uh, forward uh, uh, looking perspective, is to have some key principles in line, such as, in, in my opinion, human oversight. And in the case of, of uh, uh, dispute settlement based on a uh, 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 public uh, uh, justice, we need to keep uh, a human on the loop. I think it's very important and it's a, it's a choice. So we can do it even if the technology is good enough to uh, give us a good decision. That's my, my two remarks. Thank you, Eva. I jump in and pretend to be a panelist and say, we need to ask two simple questions. What do we want to replace and why? Uh, in China, there's a radical movement to technologize and automate judicial decision making because the Chinese state doesn't trust judges uh, and the, ch the Chinese population think that judges are corrupt. Now, if that's the case, we need to deal with that issue as much as we need to deal with the way in which automation can put a gloss on that. Uh, so I, I would encourage us to ask those questions before. I mean, I just reflect very briefly, I spoke to a student recently in Singapore who said she liked ChatGBT because she wasn't interested in critical thinking. Uh, now, if that's an admission that's being made, we need to think about those sorts of admissions, I think. Yeah, you're right. I think we have lots of additional questions that we might wish to discuss in a couple of months time. So I think to just wrap up, I want to thank you all for an immensely interesting discussion yet again. Um, and I hope we can bring you back together as a team because I, I think that team works perfectly well. Uh, and so I would say looking forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you so much.